The thing we know, and it's not speculative, is that something does go faster than light. Quantum theory violates those constraints, and more importantly, in the lab, you violate those constraints. That's what the Nobel Prize was given for two years ago. Is the speed of light an absolute fixed limit, or might this be a mistaken assumption? And I'm going to start off with Joa. Thank you. Um, well, I don't think anything is sacred. It's just, this is not religion, right? It's a science. So I do think um, we have a situation in which you can question everything. And in particular, the speed of light is one of those things which are basically up to be attacked by experiment, by theorists, by everything. And the question is not so much, can the speed of light change, but in what ways can it change? Because once you open up the the box, the Pandora box, if you want, of variability, there's not just one way of things varying, there's a huge number of ways in which they can vary. Um, so I do think things like cosmology are crying out for raising the speed limit to open up the horizons in the early universe. Things like quantum gravity, this attempt to unify quantum mechanics and gravity, which we never solved. Um, they're really asking for a destruction of the basic principle of symmetry that comes from the constancy of the speed of light, something we call Lorentz symmetry. So all these things are really asking for it. And um, I really think a lot of the contradictions we get into, a lot of the problems we have in cosmology and quantum gravity are really self-inflicted problems. We basically created a contradiction in terms trying to resolve these problems. And it's very simple to just basically drop one the assumption and see what happens. So I'm very much in favor of, uh, you know, anything is can go. This is a game of theoretical physics. We play this game. At the end of the day, experiment will decide. And I think this is the main difference. At the end of the day, it's not going to be a question of um, what do I think, what do I like, what do I believe. It's a question of what, what is the world really like. And that's a matter for experiment. Thank you. Claudia. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think I can uh, sympathize very much with what Zhao says. <laughs> it's no coincidence. I think one thing, though, is that the, the measurement of the speed of light and the fact that it was invariant, that seemed to be an absolute uh, maximum for the speed and uh, the speed of propagation of information. It led Einstein to develop the theory of special relativity and have ingrained the notion of symmetry as sort of an architecture towards which modern physics is being built. Um, and now I'm at an understanding you know, so much in taking the speed of light as being something of a, as a, as a sacred, um, as a fun foundation in assumption. It's more something that derives from the symmetry. And so you can think of the symmetries themselves um, as the architecture through which we construct and we think about how to model the world around us. And having a finite or maximum speed of propagation of information is something that comes out of it. So it's no longer an assumption, it is actually a consequence. Now the question remains the same. Should we rely on this architecture, which is beautiful, and we love, we love symmetry, we love um, those notion of, if, you, if you're not familiar with, with symmetry, where this comes from in Einstein's theory of special relativity and then to some extent in general relativity, you can think of rotations, for instance. If you're thinking of the laws of physics and you turn around, you should be observing the same thing um, overall in terms of how you describe the laws of physics. And that has to be true in space, but also has to be true in space and time. So you can think of symmetries related to rotations in space and time. And so from this beautiful way we characterize the world comes out the notion of speed of light being a maximum uh, constant. Nowadays, actually, we do know very much how to maintain this same architecture and to build on it so that we end up with a world for which the, the light itself doesn't need to propagate at a maximal speed in the same way as it would do in Einstein's theory of special relativity and then general relativity or how you could have other things, uh, maybe dark energy or the elements for which we travel faster than, than the speed of light. As soon as you start observing that there are other things out there in the universe than what we were used to originally and on which all of the symmetry were based on, uh, but we know there is dark energy, we know there is dark matter, we know there's all of this plethora of, of the things, 
They, you can ask yourself, maybe this limit is for a special sector of matter that we're very used to, but the world is much bigger than that. And there's a, the world is our oyster, really. Uh, but again, it's not what I think. It's not so much what I think, it's what, it's what nature is. And so there are observations out there, there are experiments out there that already are trying to understand how to limit those things, how, how to observe those things. And, and it will be the experiments that, that tell us at the end of the day. Thank you. Tim. Okay, um, to really get into this, I, I should reassure you, we don't have to teach you all of general relativity and quantum field theory. Um, we can actually leave quantum mechanics aside. There are two things you have to understand, which is the basic picture of general relativity and Bell's theorem. I'll say a few words about those. Now, of course, everybody's right. Nothing sacrosanct. I can talk about the, the theory according, the universe according to general relativity could be a wrong theory, right? Nothing should be sacrosanct. Um, but the first thing to notice about this whole discussion, if we take relativity seriously, either special or general, in those theories, nothing has any speed. Speeds don't exist. So as soon as you say there's such and such a maximum speed, you're actually saying something that the theory doesn't support at all. That doesn't mean you can't make sense of saying that things don't go faster than light. It just turns out you don't understand that in terms of speeds. You understand that in terms of what's called a light cone structure. So the theories say space and time in themselves have a special structure called the light cone structure. You want to impress people, call it the conformal structure. And you've all seen pictures of these cones, right? If you've read any kind of popularization. And if you give me that structure, then I can, uh, and, and if you say light propagates along those, light in a vacuum propagates along those, then you can say what I mean by saying nothing goes faster than light is that nothing that starts inside one of those cones can end up outside of it. So I have a good constraint there. Uh, how those cones are organized is very different in special relativity than generally in general relativity. It's very different in expansionary cosmology. All of that can be understood using the standard tools. Uh, and we can talk about the expansion of space, although saying it goes faster than light also just doesn't make any sense. And it doesn't cause any problems if, if space does expand. Um, the thing we know, and it's not speculative, is that something does go faster than light. And that's because if you assume that all causal influences are restricted to be within the light cone, what John Bell proved is that there are certain constraints on what any theory can predict. And quantum theory violates those constraints. And more importantly, in the lab, you violate those constraints. That's what the Nobel Prize was given for two years ago was experiments demonstrating violations of Bell's inequality. So I don't even think it's an open question whether something goes faster than light. We know that there is causation that's faster than light. How you implement that cleanly and mathematically is another question. And that nobody's worked out quite yet. And it may be that in working that out, we will have to abandon or certainly deeply modify the picture of space and time given by general relativity. I think this sort of since uh, uh, across the panel that there really isn't anything sacrosanct. Does that mean, you know, Einstein's theory is not sacrosanct? You know, that, that, that all of the key frameworks, uh, quantum field theory is not sacrosanct. Uh, it's all up for grabs. Is, is that what you're saying? Yeah. And, and, would you all, <laughs> and, and would you all agree, agree with that? Well, I, I, I do think it, it has a beautiful architecture and, and, and it puts everything together. So you can definitely start playing with it and start taking some of the pieces of the puzzle out, some of the bricks out. You're definitely allowed to do that. But you have to be very careful that not everything falls down. Uh, isn't the actual observation uh, more important than the multiple theories that we might have? And as far as our observations are concerned, isn't it the case that the speed of light appears to be the same in all directions? Not really. I mean, it depends on which, um, what do you mean? First of all, what do you mean by variability? For example, look at the rainbow. Could it be that different colors move at different speeds? But also, when physicists mean the speed of light, they don't mean the speed of actual light. They mean, of, they mean the, the structure of these light cones, which could be the speed of, for example, gravity, which could be the speed of any massless, what you call massless particles. So it's an abuse of language to say the speed of light because it's actually something else, right? What we, what we envisage. And well, we it's say, something else. It, it, it's something else within a given theory, 
but for for most of us, we have a notion of the speed of light, something traveling, you measure it, but that's it means, the speed of light. You means, might redefine it in terms of cones or whatever it would be, but that's, an, that's a new theoretical framework. No, you, for example, it's the speed of gravitons, right? So the, the graviton is a particle of gravity, right? Which, like the photon, doesn't have any rest mass, like, except that this lady over there disagreed. She begged to disagree with her. So, of course, then it's a different story. Of course, the speed of gravity, the speed of light will be different. Of course, in this situation. So, so, but they will be the same at very high frequency. I think. I think within how you define the question, you can define the question in an uh, infinite frequency limit and of uh, of, a, of a of a speed. And that is typically what is being considered as the speed of information. And that that's typically what we we try to debate on, the speed of information. And so that has no contradiction, for instance, with a accelerated expansion of the universe, where there's no speed of information that goes faster than light. Now, whether the speed of information itself could go faster than what we consider right now being the speed of light in the vacuum or the speed of information in the vacuum, that in itself is not contradictory per se to Einstein's theory of general relativity. We know very well, we know very well how to adapt for that in a way that doesn't break everything. Mm -hmm. So can I, uh, I mean, I think the way you, you, you suggested, oh, there's this easy thing we can do. We can just measure the speed and check is it the same. We can't do any such thing. There are things we can check. Michelson and Morley didn't measure the speed of anything. They set up an experimental apparatus that had some interference bands and they had it, it was in a, on a big marble slab floating in mercury and they rotated it and they looked to see whether these interference bands shifted. That doesn't measure the speed of anything if different colors of light, as it were, traveled at different speeds, then it's easy to tell uh, there's a, a sudden nova, right? A sudden uh, star appears in the sky. Well, do all the colors come in at the same time, right? You, could, you, you would notice if, no, it was first, first the purple and then the red, right? Um, but you wouldn't have measured the speed of anything by doing that. So, but I mean, in that example, we do know that the speed of light of different colors don't travel at the same speed and that we know very well and we know how light actually when we see light from different events in cosmological events light of different frequency reaches us at a slightly different time because they interact with the medium um, so they take a different time to, to reach us and that's absolutely fine and when we're talking here about the speed of light we really mean the speed of light in the vacuum or what we more mean is the speed of information the speed of propagation of information and if you don't want to talk about speed, you can think about the time delay as compared to the infinite frequency limit of, um, you, you, of those frequencies. I, I was trying to explain the actual phenomena that you can check, but talk of speeds is just misleading if you're talking about relativity because it's not a well-defined concept. It's not a well-defined quantity. Because I mean, if I, I were to ask, what, are, what speed are we going at right now? What speed are we going at right now? The answer is there's no answer to that. But, but causality right? and support outside a light cone is well defined. Yes. As, and so that yes. the, the, the sense in, we, in the question that we want to define and we want to talk about is well defined. We can ask that question and we can check it. We can check it experimentally. Yes, that's why I brought up the light cone structure in the beginning. There are questions you can ask that have clear empirical content. It just naming a speed and saying, does it change, isn't one of them. We name them, there's a huge number of things we name which don't mean anything. And it's fine, it's completely fine, as long as we know what we're talking about. Yeah, but if you're not fine. careful about... So for example, a big question... About to continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.